Hello and welcome to the first edition of the DIFC Perspective. We're here at Cipriani's in the DIFC Gate Village. We're going to be talking to Robin and Gary, two of our clients in the DIFC community from Clifford Champs and Altamimi, to discuss the issues and challenges relating to the family business sector. So gentlemen, firstly, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. And I'd like to just start asking you for your views on the trends that you see or the differences that you see between family businesses that are in the Middle East, uh, maybe in the UAE versus the trends that you see when you're dealing with clients more globally. Um, so who, who would like to start? Thanks, Marcus, for, uh, for having me here. And uh, I think it's actually very timely that the DIFC be uh, uh, sort of basically ventilating some issues around family business because it's a very important area, but it's a greatly uh, the significance of the area and the problems that family businesses face are greatly underestimated. Uh, and basically, family business is a cornerstone of, of all economies around the world. It's the most common form of business organisation. Um, there's many well-established family businesses in countries like Italy and Japan that have been um, running for centuries. Um, in the Middle East, there's an extraordinarily um, high percentage of the, the economy that's in the hands of family enterprises. Um, probably one of the greatest concentrations anywhere in the world. And in fact, 50% of the GDP of the Middle Eastern countries is actually tied up in family business. You said, for example, you, you mentioned Japan and Italy where family businesses have been operating for multiple generations. So for you, what, what is the key differences between what you see with family businesses here in the region versus those places? Well, here basically because of the rapid pace of economic development that's occurred over the last 40 or 50 years, um, the, the phenomenon that's new here is the family enterprise which is a large corporate undertaking and a large business, not just a small trading enterprise or something of that nature. And so family companies here uh, haven't been accustomed to running large and complex businesses except during the last 40 or 50 years. And as a result of that, um, what's occurred is that many of these businesses have only been um, operated by families for one or two generations. Mm -hmm. And there's no established traditional way of dealing with these issues as there has been, has been developed in some other European countries and in other parts of the world. Is that something that you, uh, you also agree with? So in terms of succession planning, going from the first to the second generation, is, is, that, is that something that you feel is a, an important issue? I, 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 I absolutely agree with that. I mean, the, the UAE in particular is a young country, it's 45 years old. Um, so the, the challenges that are being faced by families here, they're, not, they're, they're, they're all new, they're taking on these challenges for the, for the first time. Um, this sort of how do we hand the, the succession planning uh, handing over businesses from gen one generation to another. Uh, you, you can learn from other markets, jurisdictions, but there are also a lot of unique issues within the region because you've got a different legal framework here, you've got different cultural issues. So it, it's interesting and it, it's challenging. And I think a lot of these family businesses are still trying to navigate their way through the, the various obstacles along the way. So when you say those things relating there that are unique in the region culturally or because it's first, second generation, let's go into some of those issues more specifically. What does it actually mean for those family businesses? Well, I think there's a number of issues around that that are sort of unique to this region that aren't really, um, you don't see in family businesses elsewhere in the world. Um, one, one factor that's very important is the fact that the families here are so large. Um, the culture, and that's for cultural reasons, they, uh, the family, the culture favours large families. Um, uh, Well-to-do men are allowed to marry more than once um, in, in the Gulf states. And so very common in these situations, there, is, there are a lot of stakeholders. It's very common for us when we're um, brought in to advise a family to find uh, 15 to 25 heirs uh, who will be inheriting the family business in the next generation. Uh, and, and the second very important cultural issue that's also um, uh, looms large in family business succession is the Sharia inheritance rules which are uh, codified in the legal systems here uh, where basically uh, there is a formula for how the, the assets have to be distributed amongst the heirs. So for people that aren't so familiar with uh, Sharia uh, laws and regulations that may be watching this program from outside the region in summary, what, what, does, what does that mean? 
Well, well, in summary, what it means is that there's, a, there's basically a formula and a, and a prescribed way of distributing the assets. The, the, uh, usually, um, the, the widows are entitled to something, but most of the assets goes to the, the children of the, uh, of, of the estate. And the shares that the children receive, they must, there must be an equal share for every son and an equal share for every daughter. And, and the set shares the sons receive are twice that of the daughters. So there'll be examples when there may have been a son that has been actively participating in running a business for, for say, 20 years, but there may also be um, one, of the, one of the children that hasn't been running the business, but they're still entitled to the same, the same share. That's exactly right. And, and, and obviously uh, there's always differences of aptitude and sort of abilities between children in any generation. Um, but one thing that, generally speaking, the founder will not uh, be able to do in, in these Middle Eastern jurisdictions is to say, well, look, I really think um, this child should have the, the lion's share of the business because they've been, they've been running it for a period of time. Uh, this guy hasn't done so well and has, hasn't uh, su succeeded at anything much. Uh, so I don't really want him to have a say in how things um, uh, are run going forward. Is that something you, you see as well, Robert? I think arguably the the way succession works in, in this jurisdiction and in this region accelerates the need for change. Um, I think in some, if you take the Western economy where the father could just bring his son or daughter into the business, hand over the business uh, to his son or daughter, he doesn't have that flexibility in, in this jurisdiction. So the need to get your governance succession strategy right uh, is accelerated as a result of the succession laws because very rapidly you could go from being two or three shareholder company to a 20, 30 shareholder company and um, obviously the dynamic is very different. You don't necessarily have a controlling shareholder. Some are interested in the business, some are not interested in the business or will want to return. And so you, the, these conflicts uh, amongst the individuals in terms of what they want and their interest in the business uh, is a real issue that families here are facing in the kind of second, third generation, whereas maybe in other jurisdictions it could take a bit longer. There's a, well there is an expression actually that I can apply in the, in the English language, which is talking about in business sometimes you just need to cut your losses and sometimes recognise that a business that you've invested in isn't doing so well. Now when you look at family businesses here uh, in the region, do people sometimes agree to cut their losses because I've also heard for some family businesses that actually unless they're making a profit they won't divest so is, is that also another uh, challenge or some, something else that we need to need to help people think differently about in the region? Well it's a, it's a complicated question because many of these family businesses find it hard to actually work out which parts of their business are profitable and which assets are returning because um, there's the governance unfortunately has been um, is very unequal and uneven between a lot of the families. One of the reasons is that um, for the most part um, in this region there aren't any obligations to file tax returns. Mm -hmm. So many of these families actually don't have, have the imperative of sitting down and preparing a set of financials every year. Yeah. So they often don't even know themselves which bits of the business are performing or how well they're performing. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a major factor in, uh, in that. And, and there's also a bit of a um, a reluctance to um, uh, to sell an investment until it, uh, it turns good, and of course, if it's going in the wrong direction, that uh, that might take a long time. It might never happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I think a third cultural issue that I think is extremely important, um, and that can actually end up masking some potential problems and, and not uh, allowing them to, people to see them coming down the track is the fact that there's a very strong respect in the cultures, the, the Arab cultures, for the role of the patriarch. And so whilst the patriarch is alive, is active, is, is involved in the, in the family and the business, um, pretty well everyone in the family will respect their wishes. Um, and that often conceals, even from the, the founder, the fact that there might be fault lines between the siblings and between the family members that aren't visible to him because whilst he's there, everyone's doing what he asked them to do. But as, as soon as you remove the patriarch from the equation, you have a completely different situation. I'm going to ask uh, Robin, what about when it comes to challenges of governance? Uh, 
if you can look at those family businesses we talked about at the start where maybe in Japan and Italy they've had policies and procedures going back decades if not centuries. How does governance and policy procedure fit into to this kind of thing? Because especially in first and second generation family business, I can imagine a lot of it is emotionally driven or relationship driven. And you look at that Sharia law about carving up um, the, the returns from the business back to back to the various children. So yeah. what about governance? How does, how does that work? I mean, to me, getting the corporate governance right is a major way of mitigating some of the issues we've been talking about around succession, around the importance of the patriarch, for example. Um, if you've got a proper governance structure with professional management, independent board of directors, making rational business decisions rather than emotional business decisions, then it's going to be better for the health of the business and ultimately for the family shareholders. Now, there will always be matters you have to take back to your shareholders. You know, even the most mature public listed companies go back to their shareholders for um, you know, major events, event uh, corporate changing transactions. Um, so you, you're not taking away the power or influence of the family um, by having a modern governance structure. You're, you're just maybe removing the shareholder involvement in decision making on a day to day basis. Uh, uh, clearly, there will also be good family members who are well educated, well trained, understand the business, share some of the patriarch's connections. Uh, and you know, it's only right and proper that they will be involved and continue to be involved in the, in the business. So there is a place for the family in the governance structure, but it should be driven by the gov- getting the governance structure right and putting the right people in, rather than populating the management with the, with the, the family members. But I think it, it has to be driven from the patriarch uh, whilst he's still running the company mm-hmm. to, to set that in place, as Gary was saying. They, they carry a lot of influence whilst they're involved in the business uh, and succession planning for them, the best thing they could do to, in my mind is sort out the, the, the governance structure of the, of the entity. So if I was to say to you without, you don't have to name names, but if you look at the, the family businesses in the region which are getting their governance right and are being hugely, hugely successful, what kind of things are those family businesses doing? Well, I think I think one thing that they're doing is they're they're going into more um, uh, sophisticated corporate structures um, that are available now within the region, uh, and, and probably the, uh, the 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 most established and the uh, the best run of those is actually the DFC, which is where we're sitting, um, because you you have access to much more sophisticated legal structures that allow. Uh, families to tailor exactly the sort of governance arrangements they want and not have to rely on lowest common denomina- denominator decision making where every every single family member has to participate in passing a shareholders uh, general assembly resolution to get anything done. Uh, and I can think of examples of, uh, of companies that we have, have actually um, overhauled their governance structure to actually operate their holding company from, from the DFC and they have done things like they've uh, apart from uh, having the uh, setting up proper board structures they've actually separated the top board from the business board as an example so what they've done is they said we have a we have a peak board which is which is the family members who are the stakeholders and who are the equity holders um, and they will basically have a discussion between themselves about how they think things are going and whether it's serving the stakeholders and whether it's serving the family. And then below that, there'll be a board which will be a hybrid. There'll be a mixture of the, the representatives and the family and the stakeholders and, and outside people who've been brought in as experts in banking or, or operational matters or property uh, issues. Uh, and they can actually focus on getting the business right and then that puts a, a, a great, that's a great way to separate, put a layer between family issues that are playing out at the very top and making sure that the, uh, the, the, the hired professionals that work in the business don't get too wrapped up in all that stuff and, uh, and, and, and protect the, uh, the business from any differences that might, ex- might or might not exist amongst the family members. I think that's right. The distinction between the wealth management aspect and the commercial enterprise aspect is important. Uh, and families that get that right, there's some successful examples out there. Some have gone on to 
uh, raise money in the international debt markets and to do that there's a, you know, a level of transparency and reporting which it, you know, a lot of non-family companies struggle to do so if, if a family company is able to, to issue bonds as it could um, you know that they're getting their governance structure right their management structure and there probably will be a proper distinction between the commercial aspects of the business and the wealth management aspects of the business we, we've seen cases where you haven't got that in place and when things go wrong and banks start trying to look at um, the business in a, in a more forensic way and they see that family assets have been funded by the commercial aspects as, assets that the banks have financed then uh, as you move forward into a kind of restructuring scenario it's very difficult for the family to stay out of that and their personal assets have to be used to support the commercial business and maybe there are personal guarantees in place there. When, it, when you're looking at uh then family businesses choosing what structures they need. Um, they've got to obviously have a very clear strategy and look at really what they want to achieve as a, as a family business. As we move from first generation to second generation in this region, are you seeing the second generation reviewing the strategies? Because they may well have been 20, 30 years ago that the patriarch of the family said, you know what? I like a bit of retail, I like a little bit of hospitality, I like a little bit of this, I like a bit of that. And it was based on their interests rather than what necessarily made business sense. Um, and people have been very successful with, with that, let's face it. However, more and more, should they just be looking at having good commercial returns? Or We talked a bit about div uh, divestment uh, a few minutes ago, but what about company strategy? Is, is that something you're seeing change and people need to think about more? Not, not enough, to be honest. Um, I, I think that there's still uh, a bit of a trend for having good parts of a business subsidise bad parts of the business rather than exit bad parts of the business. And you know, we're in a uh, an environment where the the, the economy is changing a lot with tech and you know more competition, and it's quite a dangerous strategy to pursue um, if you continue to invest in ultimately loss-making businesses that maybe there's an emotional attachment to. Um, so I think more more companies should be taking a fresh look at are they in the, the right markets, um, what's, what's their strategy. Uh, I think the the challenge that the second generation have, and they have lots of challenges, but one of them is that you know, this patriarch has built up this great business. Uh, they don't want to unpick it. They want to, and they don't want to be seen to be leading it downhill either. So it, it can lead to uh, maybe irrational decision making. Yeah, I mean I think one thing that has actually changed during the, the period I've been um, I've been I've been here in Dubai is I think the the 2008 global financial crisis did actually change the approach of a lot of the more sophisticated and better organized families because they actually began to recognize the fact that even though they had a great core business that was making really good returns um, often there were risks associated with those businesses and, and things that, that could go wrong with them because they saw things go wrong uh, with a lot of businesses in 2008 in that era. And there's now a bigger emphasis on saying, well, look, actually what we actually need to do is we need to um, have, a, a, have a, a clear separation and clear silos set up between the risky bits of our enterprises, the bits that are exposed to markets or exposed to things like legal claims, and the, the, the more passive investments that are safe investments. So if anything goes wrong and the, 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 um, there's, there's a big oil field disaster and the, the operating business uh, uh, is become, comes into, under stress and into trouble and banks begin recalling loans, they've still got a reservoir of assets um, that the family can fall back on if times are hard. And I think there's more uh, consciousness on that since 2008. So far our conversation has talked a lot about what family businesses are doing within the UAE. Um, we know Dubai and the UAE is a regional hub for other nationalities. So for example, I think we are seeing more Indian family business based here and actually some of the longest serving family businesses in the UAE come from India. Um, we try to work across the Miasa region, so Middle East, Africa, South Asia region. What are you seeing from those kind of family businesses? Are they doing business here? Is it a jurisdiction they, they trust? Are they using it as an alternative jurisdiction from other places they may have historically done business in? What are, you, what are your views on that? Certainly seen 
more of an interest and people wanting to understand what structures are available um, for uh, setting up a sort of international holding company here. Uh, I can think of examples certainly of uh, Saudi and Egyptian family companies that have, have moved here and there are Indian family companies as well. Uh, so there's a long-standing connection between India, Indian family companies and, and the UAE. Uh, I, I think people like the flexibility that the, the regime has here. Uh, within the DIFC, I think the it, internationally people understand the, the framework, it's the, the common law framework, uh, it, it is attractive for some people and maybe it helps with some of the succession planning issues we, we talked about previously. Gary, what about your perspectives? Yes, uh, my, my experience has been mainly with, uh, with Indian families. Um, and uh, as, as Robin pointed out, there's, there's actually a long connection between um, uh, India and the UAE in terms, and it's actually surprising how many, um, how many Indian families have been here for a long time and have actually established extremely, extremely significant businesses here and done very well. Um, lately, of course, what's, there's also been a lot of um, activity uh, and a lot of growth uh, in the African jurisdictions. Um, sub-Saharan Africa and you're seeing a lot of interest and activity from Indian families who are, who are basically um, developing very entrepreneurial and exciting business opportunities in those countries uh, but they're finding that Dubai is just a perfect environment for them uh, to, to, to run a head office from in, in as much as you have uh, uh, you have a, a, a very safe and secure environment. You have a very sound legal infrastructure, which is very well thought out. Uh, you can do anything um, in the DIFC, for example, that you can do under English law, any sort of structure. And, and in fact, a few you can't, like purpose trusts and foundations, mm. uh, things like that. Uh, and it's also an extremely benign um, a, a, and favourable tax jurisdiction, which you wouldn't say about India itself. So it's, a, it's an extremely good base and platform for these families, which also operates excellent sort of logistical air yeah. services and access to those markets. I think that's right. I mean, a lot of the drivers that are bringing family offices here are the same for any financial institution, any corporate. Um, they're looking at a sound infrastructure, sound regulatory environment, ease of transportation, ability to hire good people. Um, so it ticks a lot of boxes. And I, I think you will see an increasing trend of uh, or more, a higher concentration of these sorts of businesses moving to, to the UAE, probably in particular Dubai. I think the same thing is going to apply to Chinese family businesses as well, because what is it? I was reading somewhere just a, uh, a couple of days ago that there are now over 6,000 Chinese businesses doing business in, in the UAE, um, the majority of those in Dubai. And when it comes to the One Belt, One Road approach, the China's taking its well, Dubai and the UAE is definitely going to become a, a hub for them, especially if they're going to try to Africa, uh, access Africa and other parts of the region. But I'm going to go back to a point you made there, Gary, about trusting foundations. Is that something that um, you guys have a big role to play in terms of helping family businesses when they're going from first second to second generations to how they can uh, utilise those kind of trust and trust and foundations uh, structures or regimes? Yes, absolutely. And, and the reason that... Uh, that trusts and foundations are, are, are such valuable tools for families, particularly families with large fortunes that they need to, to put in, in place stewardship arrangements, uh, is that they're actually proved to be an extremely useful tool for sort of um, basically um, sort of preserving family assets and family businesses over many generations. They're, they're, they're sort of tried and proven. Uh, the Private Interest Foundation is the European equivalent, I suppose, of the Anglo-Saxon Anglo, Anglo uh, Trust uh, concept, but, but both, both those sort of uh, vehicles and both those platforms are really the, they represent the best practice that families can adopt in terms of uh, being able to write their own rule book and, to, and they're infinitely flexible, uh, both as to sort of what happens with control of the pool of assets after the founder goes, uh, as to what the future succession arrangements will be after that um, and in addition um, in both cases you can make them entirely uh, compliant with the Sharia inheritance principles 
uh, and thus sort of bring yourself within the sort of frame of the, the local law and culture uh, in, that, in that respect as well. Are you seeing interest from your family businesses and trusts and foundations? Or is there something you're having to do a lot of education and awareness? On? Yeah, I, th I think maybe until recently, the, the, the most more sophisticated families, you know, some of them were still using trust structures, but they were having to go off to Cayman, for example. But now there's a, an alternative here. So people are, are interested in exploring it, understanding it. And yeah, sometimes people are reluctant to be the first to try something, but there have been a few now, so we will see an increase in the, the take up. How do you increase confidence in the family businesses uh, around what needs to be done? Is it a case of they listen to their peers? Is it something that um, they hear about another company's done? Or do they take the, the professional advice from, from you guys? Or I appreciate you can't make the decisions for the family, but there's a certain role that you play. So, so, so who, who's influencing and you talk about the patriarch? How, how, how is it? You know, I, I, I came out to Dubai about 14 years ago and a week after I arrived. Uh, some uh, an advisor came over from Switzerland who wanted to meet to talk about family offices, family businesses, and he he was trying to talk to me about succession. Um, we're still having those conversations now, uh, so uh, th th I think there's a bit more momentum behind it. Uh, I think patriarchs will see role models in other companies, and as I said, there are plenty of great, well structured, well managed family offices, family companies out there. Um, you know, more so than there were even 15 years ago, but there's still a lot more to, to do, I think. Obviously both sides have to play a role, like advisors have to educate the families, um, but, but I think probably the most significant factor that's seeing the rate of take-up improved is the fact that there's some very um, prominent and well-run families have actually taken their own companies in this direction, and that, that really probably carries more, more weight than anything uh, we professional advisors say. So. Based on the role that you play uh, in the in the law firms, providing a lot of advisory and consultancy to these businesses, if you were to give out that one golden nugget for here here and now, based on what you think family businesses needed to need to do, what would it be? Well, my my golden nugget for what it's worth is that the founders have to start educating their children yesterday. By, by, which, by educating, I mean actually educating them and training them in, in how bus the business should be run and how they should be working together in the business and, and they should actually be brought into the decision making tent uh, in some way and they should actually be shown all the problems of the business, the dilemmas that you get in the business, uh, shown the difficulty of the decisions that have to be made in the business and, and also practice working together and cooperating and accepting uh, that, that, that things, decisions may be taken that you don't necessarily agree with. And if that starts at an early age, the, uh, you know, basically things will go much better in the long run. If it doesn't start early and the, uh, the founder um, does everything um, on his own without consulting anyone, and, and the children are never brought in uh, to the tent and don't understand what he does or what goes on, there will be problems. Yeah, well, I think that's right. I mean, we, we keep coming back to governance and the importance of governance, and there's different, there's no sort of one size fits all. Um, but I, I think evolving the governance structure of a company away from one individual dominating everything and all day to day decision making to introducing more family members. Uh, more independent board members and maybe a more rational, refreshed look at the, the business strategy of what we should be doing, where we want to go, uh, what we need to exit from. Uh, and I think the time to do that is sooner rather than later. Uh, if it happens, or people try to do it after the patriarch is, is gone, then uh, the scope for conflict and difference of opinion is much, much greater. No. Gents, thank you very much for, for joining us today. I do appreciate it. We spent a lot of time talking. What we haven't done is spent enough time meeting um, the stunning desserts that Cipriani have um, given to us today. So um, I'm going to wrap up the conversation and allow us to start doing some eating. But thank you very much for, for joining me, Robin and Gary. It is appreciated. Thank you.